Hi, I'm Campbell Harvey, Professor of Finance at uh, Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. And I'm back on Fuqua's uh, LinkedIn Live. Uh, I talked to you actually April 8th, so three months ago, at the height uh, of the crisis. We're on like an exponential curve and it didn't look good at all. And the theme of my talk back then was uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel in terms of both um, the biological aspect to this crisis as well as the economic uh, implications. So I think over the last three months, uh, we've seen uh, this light at the end of the tunnel uh, emerge. So we're in a much better spot today than we were at the beginning uh, of April. So what I'd like to do today is mainly take your questions, but I'd like to sketch out uh, seven risks to the economic path forward. So anytime you make a forecast, and my forecast was uh, a rather rapid recovery after uh, this crisis. And the logic was fairly simple, that this crisis was not induced by a structural problem in the economy. In the global financial crisis, we had a structural problem. So our banks let us down. Our financial system made the crisis far greater than it should have been. So this time around, we're hit with a biological shock that uh, is, you can't really point to any one sector or any one company as basically making this worse. It's just not the case. Indeed, the companies that have been worst hit are companies that were doing well uh, before uh, the biological crisis. So the logic that I had was that given that there wasn't a structural problem, and given that our policymakers can basically put the economy uh, or many firms in stasis, that we could reawaken and have a fairly robust growth. Obviously not getting back to exactly the spot that we were in, but nevertheless, this could be a quick uh, recession. And indeed, I labeled this the great compression, that we would have just horrible economic news like we've never seen before. But then we would see positive economic news like we've never uh, seen before. So that was the logic. And part of the logic was biological, that uh, there is uh, research going on that can essentially cure um, this economic crisis. And the cure, obviously, is biological. But today, what I really want to do is to talk about risks. Anytime you have a forecast, you need to talk about risks. So risk is uh, essential to understand when the forecast actually can go offside. So uh, I have summarized this in terms of seven different risks. The main thing, of course, what I want to do is to answer your questions uh, directly. So uh, those questions are being collected and I will try to get to as many as possible. So let me start off by talking about the risks uh, to the economic recovery. Number one is what I call rose-colored glasses. And I'll go through a little detail on each one. Number two is a biological setback. Number three is debt overhang. Number four, is policy fumble. Number five is unexpected inflation. Number six is an October surprise. And number seven, I call the fire drill, and I'll talk about that a little later as to what I actually mean by that. So let's go through them uh, one by one. And again, it's important uh, when you do any sort of economic forecasting to understand both the risks to the upside and the downside. So I'll mainly talk about the downside uh, today. So number one, rose colored glasses simply uh, refers to people looking at uh, the data and interpreting the data in a way that is far too optimistic. So it's a, basically a, a bias of overconfidence. And a good example that I've talked about in my LinkedIn posts 
Uh, and by the way, uh, follow me on LinkedIn uh, because I do put things up um, sometimes daily uh, on this uh, economic crisis. So the idea here with overconfidence is uh, it has many dimensions. On one dimension, uh, it's biological. The people see that the, the death rate is going down, the hospitals aren't as crowded and become careless in terms of wearing masks or social distancing. And when you become careless because of the overconfidence, you see a surge. And that's exactly what we've seen. So that is definitely uh, a risk. Uh, overconfidence also plays out in a different way that people think, oh, well, this is gonna be over uh, in a month or two, everything back to normal, yet they forget that they've taken out debt. So they might've run up their credit card or a company might have um, borrowed money. So that debt needs to be repaid. And it's not like you exactly go back to where you started. So, so again, that could cause a kind of a slower growth or a slower recovery. So number two is a biological setback. And in terms of that particular setback, it could, again, have multiple dimensions. It might mean that we don't make the progress that we expect on a vaccine. It might mean that we are disappointed with the progress in terms of the pharmacological uh, solutions that could mitigate. It might be that uh, the virus mutates in a very unfavorable way that's unexpected and potentially uh, it reduces the viability of the vaccines that are work in progress. Uh, it might be a second large wave. Uh, we're seeing something like that in the US right now, and that can be devastating for the economy. If we go back to lockdown, uh, you can be sure that we will experience a W, um, and a W-shaped recovery is a dreaded double dip, and we definitely don't want that. So number three is what I call debt overhang. And let me pitch that idea. Uh, that idea is uh, there's a company that uh, has weathered the crisis, but taken on some debt to actually do that. They uh, come up with a, a new technology, it looks really interesting. They think that it's got maybe a 30% uh, rate of return that's expected, which is really good. Uh, they go to the bank and the bank says, no, we can't lend you any money to finance this project because you have too much debt. So that project's not pursued. And that's exactly the type of project that we need for a robust recovery. There's a similar sort of notion for consumers where the consumer is over levered, maybe on credit card or line of credit, and they essentially can't do the things that they wanna do. It causes a slower growth. So debt overhang is a very serious uh, issue that could slow growth rate in the future. So number four is a policy uh, fumble. And this I could talk about all day, um, but again, I wanna get to questions, but there's many different aspects to this fumble. So think about it this way, that uh, the cost of this crisis is in the ballpark of $10 billion a day. So think about that money, $10 billion a day. And then think about what we're actually spending on biological uh, solutions and mitigations. So think about the cost of testing everybody and testing everybody every two weeks. Well, that's really expensive. But if you think about it in the context of $10 billion a day, it's cheap. It's really cheap. And I'm afraid that historically, we have just not invested in this. Having done 40 million tests in the US is it's just not enough. That's just not good enough. And we need to continue to invest in testing and contact tracing. So I worry that we're not balancing the costs and the benefits. 
Uh, there's other issues that I'll talk about a little later um, that have to do with this attitude that we can just print money to solve all of the problems. When you print the money or you borrow, you need to pay it back somehow. You either pay back the debt or you pay it back with unexpected inflation. And that's the number five. So number five is unexpected inflation. And again, I worry a lot uh, about this. People will say, well, in the global financial crisis, we had quantitative easing, which is effectively printing money, and we didn't see any inflation. And then people will say, well, given that there was no inflation in the global financial crisis and afterwards, then we can do the same thing. So we can just borrow and we can just uh, print money. And we'll see the same thing, like no impact. I'm really nervous about extrapolating from one data point. So this time is different. So the amount of quantitative easing is unlimited. And there is an attitude that we should just spend money. Indeed, there's a bill um, in Congress um, that's proposed that uh, essentially uh, the uh, treasury instructs the mint to produce two platinum coins, each one worth $1 trillion. The Fed would then buy these and we'd have all the money we need. That, think about that. So do you think that that would actually solve the problems? It's just printing, we will pay for that. And it's kind of interesting to me that the market has completely discounted the possibility of a surge in uh, inflation. So the way I look at it is fairly simple. To raise taxes, to pay for the debt that we've taken is toxic for any politician. You wanna avoid that. However, Inflation, which kind of solves the problem also, you can blame it on the COVID-19. Well, it's not my fault. And inflation is regressive. It hurts the people that can least afford it. The market, again, is completely um, uh, discounting the possibility of a surge in inflation. I think it is a credible risk. Okay, number six. I don't have much to say on this um, because the title is October Surprise. And by definition, a surprise is a surprise. But I do worry about a situation in October, given the history of October surprises, and especially in the last election where we had three separate uh, surprises. What I worry about is a surprise that is not uh, John Podesta's emails being leaked, um, but something that's more economically oriented and that could derail the recovery. So the last risk is kind of a longer term risk and I call it the fire drill. And what I mean by this is the following. So pandemics are, are nothing new. Uh, some people call them a black swan, but that's just not the case. We've had plenty of pandemics historically, but the last big one was 102 years ago. So I think that some people falsely think, well, uh, it's a once in a century event. We won't have to deal with it in the future. And I think that that's a big mistake. So you need to plan for this type of risk to happen again. And we don't want it to happen again, but we can mitigate the impact of this risk by taking actions uh, in the near term. And it might not be 102 years. It might be next year and we need to be ready. We were not ready this time. And this is why I call it a fire drill. Think of the COVID-19 as a fire drill, that the next one could be much more serious. 
So, so again, I think uh, it's incumbent upon our policymakers and all of us as individuals to make sure that we basically undertake what I call basic risk management, to be ready for this, to invest in advance in the technologies that potentially could develop a vaccine uh, sooner rather than later, to invest in pharmacological um, solutions, to invest in an antibody research. All of this is going to be important for the next time. So to treat this as a dry run, I think is really, really important for the strength of the economy going forward. We've seen both the biological cost of this crisis, which is horrific, but we've also seen like an unprecedented um, drop in economic activity where we have not just a recession in the US, but we have worldwide recession. I was talking last night to a colleague in uh, Australia and uh, Australia hadn't had a recession in 30 years. So they thought they were over it, but they're in recession right now. So in this one, there's no place to hide. So those are the risks. And I don't want you to misinterpret what I'm saying. Um, I still believe uh, that there is a possibility of a robust recovery from this. I believe that we will have a viable vaccine in the fall of 2020, and it will be deployed by 2021. That's my forecast. However, there are certain things that can disrupt the accuracy of that forecast, and that's why it's important to go through an exercise like we're going through uh, today, to list those risks and to assess what they mean in terms of the economic implications. And of course, the economic implications have financial implications, and that's where I come from as a person that works in academic finance. Okay, so those are my kind of opening remarks. And now what I'd like to do is to go uh, to the questions that uh, have been asked and, um, and, and kind of pick a few um, to go through. I see that there's uh, a lot of them. So let me take a look at uh, the list here and I see a question from uh, Nicholas, who's a, an alum uh, in Berlin. Uh, and uh, the question has to do with the differential responses of different uh, countries. In particular, um, Germany essentially allocated 20% of its GDP to basically get through uh, the crisis. So, um, so, so I guess the question is, um, Germany has been very successful in what they've done in terms of both the, uh, the biological mitigation and in terms of a massive uh, fiscal stimulus, which I call um, the bazooka approach. So to be clear, this uh, sort of action is much larger than the US. So how do we explain that? Well, Germany actually could do this because they've been frugal compared to other countries in the EU or many other countries in the EU and especially the US. So you think about what happened the global financial crisis in the US happened uh, 2007, 2009, and the deficits exploded as a result of that. And after 2009, there was slow growth in 2010, but then we, we go into a period of unprecedented um, growth in terms of the length of time from the trough to the peak. So it, it, it's extraordinary uh, the amount of time. Yet every single year, the US ran deficits. Okay, so when you do that, you actually reduce the flexibility 
of responding to a crisis like that. So there was plenty of time to actually reduce those deficits to surpluses, pay down some of the debt, and to be in a position to respond like other countries. But that's not what happened. So again, the responses, there's two types of responses. One is a fiscal response, where you actually borrow money and then spend that money. There's also a monetary response. And that's where you essentially print money. And uh, while it doesn't seem like the cost of that directly, there can be a cost uh, because that can lead to unexpected inflation. And again, inflation is not a good thing. We have seen that before. Many people don't remember. I definitely remember um, what happened in the late 1970s and 1980s. And this was not just a US problem. It was a problem in many different countries. And what we don't want is for the US currency to be debased and for it no longer to be kind of the numeraire currency uh, in the world. So there's plenty of risk here. And my answer, um, Nicholas, is, is basically Germany did it because they could do it because they had the, the capacity um, because they had not been spending in the past uh, like other countries. Okay, um, I see a question um, and that is from David Baker, um, who's an MBA alum in Philadelphia. And uh, it has to do with some of these risks uh, could be at odds uh, with each other. So, so effectively, you need uh, a policy response that basically mitigates the structural damage uh, to the economy. But that policy response could actually lead to inflation in the future. So that's a great point, uh, David. And, um, and, and what you're saying is exactly true. So that's why we need to be very measured about this. So that's why it's probably, not probably, <laughs> it is a mistake uh, to mint these two um, $1 trillion coins. So I think that the responses that we've had already in the US have been aggressive. And if we go beyond those responses, then, and then we get to your question exactly, that um, too much could cause another type of risk uh, to be realized, and that's unexpected inflation. So it's a balancing act. I totally agree. And maybe it's easy for me to say um, what I'm saying. I'm not in uh, DC uh, making the decisions, um, but you have to balance. And to think that there is basically unlimited money you can print to solve this problem, no. So think about this. Um, the amount of debt that each taxpayer faces in the US um, for like the federal government is about $200,000. That's a huge amount. Actually, it's interesting to contrast this with Norway. Their pension fund has $1 trillion and they've got 5 million of people. So it's the complete opposite. So they've got $200,000 each in the bank with their pension. So, so again, what I'm saying, we just need to be careful that if we go too far, then we run this risk of unexpected uh, inflation. Um, so uh, there's a question um, from Ibrahima, um, who's an alum and uh, in Cary, North Carolina. And the question has to do with, uh, could this evolve into a massive uh, corporate debt crisis greater than the mor mortgage crisis of 2008? So I think that the risk of that happening is, is not very high. Um, and let me talk in a little more detail about this. So 
in uh, 2008 well, and before, our banks had extreme leverage. So they're using our deposits, were, which were insured by the FDIC as collateral uh, and borrowing a lot of money. And when you have leverage like 40 to one and a small thing happens, then it's a big thing. And that's exactly what happened. Um, so that leverage made that recession a great recession. So this time around, uh, the level of corporate debt is nowhere near as extreme. The banks have been basically told um, that they need to do stress tests. New sets of regulations apply to them to avoid that cascading effect that we actually had. So, uh, so I think that the other factor I mentioned right at the beginning is that it wasn't like an obvious structural problem uh, in the economy. So the structural problem is well understood in the global financial crisis, but this time around, there wasn't a, a problem. So will we see bankruptcies? Well, we've seen bankruptcies already, but these are mainly firms that we're gonna go bankrupt anyways, and the crisis just sped it up. So, so I don't think we're going there, and, uh, and I do think it also helps that the level of interest rates is really low. So you have to actually look at the interest cost of the debt. So the, the government benefits by that and corporations also benefit from this low level of debt. So the last thing I'll say um, is that, look, um, if there is a surge in unexpected inflation, those low levels of interest rates go up and become medium or high levels of interest rates. And that could be devastating. Uh, in terms of corporations. And it certainly would be costly uh, for governments also. So, so I think that uh, for me, the corporate debt crisis is more linked to the monetary policy. And if we can uh, basically reduce that probability of inflation, I think that that uh, would be like a wise thing uh, to do. Um, okay, so I see a question about um, from Shobi uh, in Cincinnati, uh, also one of our MBAs. Um, and this is the effect on uh, macro economies, not just in the US over the next five years, and what is kind of the outlook for employment. So so again, uh, let me compare what we're doing to the global financial crisis. And this is going to be uh, the last question, unfortunately. Uh, in the global financial crisis, we had just no idea when it was going to end. It was over in 2009. Unemployment continued to go up into uh, 2010. And people didn't hire. It was a terrible environment because you just didn't know if it was going to drag on for a decade. This crisis is different. It's going to be over. We will have a vaccine um, likely uh, deployed by the first quarter of 21. And the vaccine is effectively the antidote. So I think that this particular crisis is way different. So the outlook is much more favorable uh, than it was in the global financial crisis, because we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. The solution is a biological solution. And there are uh, like 150 vaccines in development, more than 10 on trial. And it doesn't matter if only 10% uh, actually succeed. Given that we've got so many, something will actually happen. So I think that's the key difference to understand. So I do think that the outlook for employment is much more favorable. Um, given we're having what I call the Great Compression, we get bad news really quickly, we'll have good news really quickly. So uh, I need to sign off at this point. Um, this happens every Wednesday at 12.30 uh, Eastern. And my colleague, uh, Jamie Jones, uh, will be on next week um, to talk about um, how companies have innovated uh, during the pandemic. 
So tune in uh, next week.